Testing one, two. Testing one, two.
It's my privilege to welcome you to Parents Weekend and to our worship service. I'd like to say thank you to our musicians. You will be hearing from them throughout this service and throughout this day. If you were here last night, you uh, were able to hear some beautiful music from um, our student uh, musicians. Um, thank you also to our music teachers, Candace Nesmith uh, for vocal music and Mark Torsney instrumental. And this beautiful string group, Sinfonietta, which was actually started by Mark's predecessor, Mr. Chuck Zacharias over here, who pulled our string program together many years ago. So thank you to everyone who ministers in music. And thank you to parents for coming to this weekend. This is a full church, and that is good to see. There is some overflow in the uh, fellowship hall. Um, where you can watch on video streaming if, uh, if that's necessary. But if you have seats and you can push together and create space, that would be good for those that are still coming in. If you're a parent and you've registered as you were supposed to, then good for you. You're on an academy campus, you're following rules, that's a good thing to do. So thank you parents for being cooperative. Your children are cooperative. This is a test to see how you do. If you haven't, registered, then the table in the foyer would be the place to stop and uh, get some additional information. And then parents also remember, your children voluntarily wrote nice things about you. If you don't, if you haven't wanted that recently, you will in the future. So uh, go into the fellowship hall, there you'll find some trees and designated graduation years of your young person and you'll find the uh, card there that they wrote. Take that with you because uh, they have uh, written some nice things, we hope, uh, about you and uh, you'll want to stop by and see those. Now there's a full day of activity on this program. On the back you'll see everything listed so please make it to as many of these events as you can. Lunch will be right afterwards in the cafeteria. We've got extra seating outdoors and around the periphery, four serving lines, so things will move quickly. So we invite you to come to lunch right afterwards, and then there are a number of other then activities throughout the day. Um, one note, there is a, uh, a reception for parents of new students, first-year student parents, um, this evening back here in the fellowship hall at uh, 515. So you'll want to come by for that if you're a parent of a uh, first year student at GCA. Come by and check that out. And also just as a, as a kind of a little thing that we need to get done, a little bit of a housekeeping thing that would be really helpful to us. Tonight at Football Mania, look for a table for our school nurse or nurses, but I think Mrs. Hudson's going to be there, and uh, there is a form that parents need to make sure they've completed. Some of you have done it. If you have it, please look for that tonight at uh, Football Mania. I'd also like to uh, especially thank those who put this weekend together and have worked hard to make this happen. Um, that is coordinated on campus by Nancy Gerard my wife, who is in charge of our alumni and development office. And uh, she is not with us today, cannot be here. Uh, her father turns 90 years old in November and as a former principal and for the last few decades volunteer at Andrews Academy, Andrews Academy alumni uh, weekend this weekend, they are honoring Nancy's father and so she decided after much coercing that she needed to be there instead of here. So if you're wondering where she is, she's, that's where she is. Felt that the cruise, I'm um, gonna say the alumni weekend uh, was uh, more important than being here. <clears throat> but we've hired additional staff in alumni and development office and Mrs. Kaylee Kelch is marshalling all of us today and and has helped to put all of this together. So where's Kaylee? Oh, there she is. Thank you, Kaylee. I'd also like to thank 
the uh, leadership team for parents in support of GCA. This uh, team consists of the following people, and if, you're, if they're here, I'd invite them to stand as I read their names. Donna and Tony Bauman, Laura and Ed Dancic, Melinda and Todd Goodman, Noel and Daryl Holland, Chichi and Chuck Onije, Shannon and Darren Scott, and Marsheri and Todd Wilkins. So thank you to these parents who put in extra time and energy. And I'd like to invite Laura to come up. If you have questions or concerns, and you, you can, you're welcome to ask any of these members of the leadership team, or of course to contact any of us who work here, but Laura Dancic has some important announcements. Thank you. I'd like to read you the school mission statement. To know Jesus as Savior and friend. To love God and those he brings into our lives. To serve the church and the society. That's really a high standard mission statement, don't you think? And I am so grateful to God that our children are at this school and we have a daughter that graduated from this school. And I don't think sometimes that they realize the difference that it makes for them to be here. If my husband and I had chosen the easy route, let them be picked up by a bus and go to free education, their lives would be very different. You know what, I decided to look up the mission statement for our local public school. This is what it is. Be a leader, be a learner, be a tarpon. A tarpon is a very large fish, we're from Florida. So I'm hoping that someday my children will come to Ed and I and say, thank you for sending us to GCA where we could become disciples instead of very large fish. <laughs> We've been here, this is our fifth year, and I can tell you that this school has in its DNA that mission statement every day. They live out this mission statement, and PSGCA has started a, a project this year. And we've got a, a devotional book that will be coming out for 2016, and it is based on our mission statement, to know, to love, to serve. Now, I've writ I have read many of the devotional entries that the students have written, and I'm gonna tell you, you will be touched by their testimonies. Many, many of them are short because of space, but they have given their hearts to write in this book, and you're going to want that. So please look at the announcement in your bulletin and pay attention to that. Um, I do want to make an announcement to the sophomores who took the PSAT that didn't get a chance to send it in. Check your email this week. We are sending you a link so you can send it in because we want you to be included in this book that will be coming out just before December home leave. Now, there are two people which we would not have this project be taking place without, and that is Timothy and Sue Hallquist. I'd like for them to stand. They own... They own Teach Services, and the, it's a publishing company, and Timothy's the one that came to us with this idea. They have donated all of their professional services to make this book possible, and uh, Timothy has donated quite a bit of patience working with me, uh, answer, asking the same questions over and over again because I'm not used to having to do something like this, and, and he's, even this morning, tried to calm me down with, with issues that we're trying to deal with, and uh, without them. It's a generous donation, thousands of dollars that they are giving so that we can make this book possible. And this is our biggest opportunity to thank them. So thank you, Timothy and Sue. Well, thank you, Laura, for all of your work and especially for this new devotional book. We'll contain stories written by many of your children and some alumni and faculty and those and amongst those stories will also be um, devotionals written by sophomores who didn't get a chance to turn them in during the PSAT. One more uh, quick note this is a uh, the 50th year this spring that we will have held an alumni weekend for GCA. We're in our 50s now as an academy and also the first year <clears throat> that we have our first third generation GCA family here 
Noelle Lucas is a student here. Where is she? Is she here today? Noelle, right there. Stand up, stand up. Where? Oh, oh there, there she is, right over there. I don't know if your mother is here. Is Jennifer here? Jennifer Fuller Hornish. There she is. There's over here. Very good. And is your dad Ken here? No, he's not. Okay, well, Ken is not here, but we will uh, make him pay later. <laughs> so we are grateful for our first third generation. Now, that was done by way of example, okay? So go and do likewise. For those of you. <laughs> we are privileged also week after week to have Pastor Greg Hudson as our local church pastor. I know we've had many uh, announcements, and we're waiting to get into our worship time, but I just wanted to give one more welcome uh, from the GCA church family. Uh, he mentioned this is our, the school's 50th year. Well, it was in about the early 90s that a, a group of community people decided that there needed to be a full-time church on this campus, not just when the students were here. And so for many years, the church family met in the uh, chapel, which I guess is that direction, and uh, in about three weeks, we will have the, the 10 year uh, anniversary of being in this, in this structure, in this building. And you may see some signs in the lobby and other places about what our church mission statement is. It's, it's a little bit different than the school mission statement, but it ties in very well. Uh, the GCA church family exists to capture the hearts and minds of young people and to develop them into fully devoted disciples of Jesus Christ. That's why we're here. To, uh, because of the students. You see, this church is made up of uh, three different units. We have 240, 250 students that are a part of our church family. We also have faculty members that are a part of our church family. And then we have community members. They don't have kids here. They don't work here. They just have a passion to fulfill that mission statement, to capture the hearts and minds of young people, and to develop them into fully devoted disciples of Jesus. And uh, next week is home leave. We will be much less crowded next Sabbath. There won't be any need to, to be in the fellowship hall. But we will also miss part of our church family because the students that are here are an integral part. You see them uh, singing, performing, greeting, um, doing lots of different things. That's not just because it's parent weekend. That's what we do every Sabbath. Uh, we have students involved in every aspect of our church from board meetings to children's Sabbath schools to being up front because we exist to capture the hearts and minds of young people. You may have seen on the, on the, on the table out front how we plan to do that. And I'm not going to take all the time to go through this, but if you want to just see a little bit more of what our philosophy as a ch church is, we want students while they're here to know about God, to grow in their uh, skills of, of church and outreach, and then to go into the world uh, personally and locally and globally to make a difference. And in order to do, do that, we as a church uh, want to uh, provide opportunities for seven different things. And I'm just going to read through these really quick. We want to pro provide means and opportunity and help for students uh, to be involved in daily Bible study and prayer in their, in their daily life. We want to provide opportunity for students to participate in small groups, to be involved in church ministries, and not just helping, uh, but also receive some training and leadership in the church. And then we want to send our students out to go, to win someone to Jesus in the Adventist movement, uh, to help be involved in public sharing of, of the gospel, and then, as possible, to go into all the world, besides just Calhoun, besides just uh, your hometown. And so we provide uh, opportunities uh, for students to be involved in these basic seven things. And I just encourage you to grab one of those flyers on the table as you leave. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask me. We, we welcome you to be a part of our church family today. And we welcome you anytime that you're able to be here. And now we'll uh, worship together with our praise group today. Really quick. Welcome to church. Please sing with us.
So excited to be here with you guys to worship with you. Today we're going to be singing a song called Holy Spirit. And for the students here at GCA, this has kind of been our theme song for this year. We started off this year with a concert, an outdoor concert that we do here. And this song was kind of, I think it was our ending song. And it just put the whole mood for this whole school year right at, at least I think. Um, throughout the song, all it says is just like, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. And that was really our cry out to God just to come here because we just wanted him to just be at the school, to be everything that we did at the school, to be involved in that, and we wanted that to be our focus. And so I think doing this song and singing this song and worshiping with this song, I think it's changed our, our outlook on what we want for this year. So as we sing it today, we want to invite you guys to be a part of that and to ask God to come and worship here, maybe in your own lives or just as a church today. So we hope that you sing with us. And 
my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. Sing it with us, please.
seated. We've been going through the book of Acts, and it's been amazing looking at the story of when Jesus is with his disciples, he's about to leave them, and he tells them a couple times in a couple different ways, you're going to do great things. Stay connected to me, and you'll be amazed at the results. But he never says, because of the amazing talents you have, because of the amazing abilities that you have, or because of the incredible people you are, it's always, stay connected to me and you'll be amazed at the things that will happen. The offering is for the Worthy Student Fund. And when I think about the needs of the Worthy Student Budget, the number of kids that wouldn't be able to be here without a Worthy Student Fund, I look at that and say, well, I don't know what I can do there. I mean, if a kid's 100 bucks short, hey, I'm your guy. If a kid's $6,000 short, I don't know what to do there. But I think we need to be reminded of Jesus saying, it's not what you have. It's not all the abilities and the talents and the possessions that you have. It's you allowing me to work through you. You'll be amazed at the miracles that can happen from that. A couple chapters later, Peter heals a man in the temple and all the people are amazed at it. And they're, they're just flocking to Peter, just amazed at it. And Peter very by this. Why are we shocked when God performs a miracle for people that he loves so deeply? The number of students that receive the Worthy Student Fund is huge. The number of miracles that happen every year for kids that have no idea how they're going to be at GCA, for parents who have no idea how they can afford it. And the miracles come through. And it's because people allow themselves to be used by God, even in small steps. The needs are huge, the resources are many, but the miracles are astounding. The deacons would stand, please. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for GCA. Thank you for working through this school, and thank you for allowing us to be a part of it. Thank you for allowing us to, uh, to allow you to work through us. Forgive us for the times that we've seen obstacles and been intimidated, or we've seen obstacles and have chosen to do nothing. Help us to choose you and to be open to you and the miracles that you can perform through us. Thank you for the resources that we have, and thank you for the ability that we have to share our resources. 
and the confidence that we have that together we can, we can pay the bills and it can all be okay. Thank you for these parents and the families represented here and the commitment they, they have to Christian education. And thank you for just all the ways you bless us. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning. Our scripture reading today is from Matthew 13, 31 and 32, if you would like to turn in your Bibles with me. He presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. And this is smaller than all other seeds, but when it is full grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. I'd like to invite you to join me in prayer at this time. Father in heaven, Lord, truly we are blessed to be here in your presence, a place, Lord, where we are safe. Today, Lord, we give you thanks and praise and glory for the place that you have made here at GCA. For so many people, for so many years, Lord, you have made this place a blessing. And we enter in in this time of worship now, Lord, to find that special blessing that you would have for each of us. Lord, let us lay down the troubles, the anxieties, and the fears that we have carried. And Lord, let us have a clear vision of heaven. Lord, speak to us through your word, through your servant today. And Lord, bring glory into our hearts all by your Holy Spirit. For this today, we all say thank you, Jesus, in your holy name. Amen.
the morning students. Everything was great when you woke up. All of a sudden you went to something, something happened, someone said something, something happened, they looked at you funny, and it was like, ah. Oh. But there's the other side. Somebody noticed that something wasn't right. So they came and either gave you a hug, prayed with you, maybe even walked in with baked goods. Maybe even gave you a coupon for something. And you're like, whoa, God, you are taking care of me. God asks us to be his hands and his feet. Not for others just to minister to you, but for us to go out and minister to others. As Camarada sings this morning, listen to the words. How God can use us in the smallest ways, which are really huge ways. Let me be your son. 
Well, good afternoon, everyone. Not too many times I get to say that in Georgia Cumberland churches. Amen. Somebody knows what I'm talking about there. I want to just thank uh, Drs. Uh, Gerards for allowing me to be here to speak at this uh, parent weekend. Um, and I know there are a lot of other important people that I also should be thanking, but I'm also looking at the time because I know the Adventist mindset is potluck time. <laughs> it's time to eat, so we're going to just jump right into the sermon, and I, I pray that uh, God will just speak to us today. It's just going to be a heart-to-heart -heart talk. What do you say? So before we get started, let me just uh, pause for a word of prayer. Father, today I ask that you might allow me to humbly be your silence and to humbly be your shout. And Lord, may we all be your grace as we seek to serve, to love, to grow, and to inspire the youth who are among us. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I've um, been living here in the Calhoun area now for almost three years. Time goes by fast. And one of the hardest things that I found to do was to find a good barber. I'd go to one person, he says, I have 30 years of, of, of barbering, and I, I, I allow him to cut my hair, and I say, you know, I don't see it. You know, this, this is not 30 years of barbering right here. And so I was finally able to find a barber who knew what he was doing. I like this barber because he would, uh, you know, he's, he's done his thing, and you know that he's winding up, and so he's kind of turning you around in the chair, and he's snipping a little bit here and trimming a little bit there, and he'll stand back and he'll look at it. And then when he's finally finished, when he's satisfied, he will say these words. He'll say, perfect. And man, when I hear those words, perfect, I get up out of that chair walking out of there feeling like I'm a movie star. Like I'm Bernie Mac or somebody. <laughs> or maybe even that other guy up there, Ron Smith. I don't think Ron Smith has ever had a bad hair day. He is always looking good and put in place. And so I walk out, because, and, I, and I feel very confident because I feel and I think that my hair is perfect. Perfect. You know, many times we think the same way about our kids. We want them to be perfect with every strand of life neatly in place. And so we do what we can to place them on a pathway to religious perfection. When I say perfection, I'm talking about perfection as we find it in Jesus Christ. And so as good families, as good parents, we, we take time and we do family worship together. We make sure that our, our kids are, are taking part in church services and doing things in church. We're running them to Pathfinder clubs and youth events, hoping that by so doing, the kingdom of God is, is, is growing in their lives. That perfection itself might be taking root. We send them to the finest of Christian schools, yay, GCA. Oh, come on. I, I know you're tired. <laughs> that's what that's all about. We send them to this great school, hoping that the kingdom of heaven would dawn in their hearts and that Christ will become real to them, and that they will grow in their personal relationship with God, and that maybe, maybe they might experience Jesus Christ and, and be able to reach out and touch the very hem of his garment to allow some of his perfection to rub off. And then we send them to summer camp. We send them on mission trips, hoping that through these events, they might have an encounter with Jesus Christ. 
even though they might be looking around looking at a guy or or a girl that they might want to have an encounter with instead. But nevertheless, we send them. And when they come back to the dorm after a mission trip, they're changed by the experience, aren't they? And they have a high appreciation after the mission trip. They have a high appreciation for cafeteria food. (laughs) Beds that were once uncomfortable are now very comfortable. And they're very elated when they once again receive cell phone coverage, even though the signal might be weak. Have mercy. They come back from youth retreats charged up with the spirit of God, ready to attack the very gates of hell with water pistols if they were asked to do so. And during weeks of prayer, they they make heartfelt commitments to God, vowing never to eat cheese again. (laughs) Or to read their Bibles and pray every day so that they can grow Grow, grow. All that stuff is is great stuff. And we enjoy seeing our kids grow in their relationship with Jesus Christ. Faculty members, we celebrate. You know, look, they're getting closer. But then there's this thing called time. With the passage of time, things seem to slowly revert back to their former ways. And of course, some of it lingers on for some. Then time comes for our youth to come back to us at home, on home leave. And they come home tired and starving, having severe meat and sugar withdrawals, (laughs) wanting to be left alone with their full bandwidth Wi-Fi and cable. Can I get amen from the students? Watch out, parents. And it's okay. I mean, we're we're glad to see them come home. We we celebrate. We pull out the best of delicacies. We, we, We stock up the cupboard with snacks and all that kind of stuff. And we give them their alone time. And it's wonderful. It's great. But sometimes they... They do not come home alone. I'm not talking about those earthly friends. I'm talking about that other friend. That friend called attitude. Somebody say have mercy. Attitude comes in with our kids and, you know, we feel guilty as parents because in our heart we're thinking it. We're thinking, I can't wait till home leave is over. (laughs) So that I can send them back and send their little friend attitude back with them. But of course, we dearly miss them when they when they go back to school. We miss them and we can't wait till the next time they come back home on home leave and also leave to go back to school. And so with all these things that we're doing for our kids, our heart's desire is to see them embrace the kingdom of heaven, to grow in the grace of God, to learn how to love Jesus Christ. And so the question that continues to nag us as as parents, as teachers, educators, the thing that continues to nag us is how do we succeed in bringing about the growth of the kingdom of God in the lives of our children where they choose for themselves to live for Jesus? And that is the topic that I want to talk to you about a little bit today. I'm going to move right to our text for the day. I found in Matthew chapter 13, verses 31 and 32. And I'm going to be reading to you. It's going to be on the screen here. Speaking of Jesus... The scriptures say he presented another parable to them saying the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field. And this is smaller than all other seeds but when it is full grown 
it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. A little bit of commentary stuff here. There's a lot of discussion about Jesus' comparative description of the size of a mustard seed. He says it's the smallest seed in the garden, but we know that it is not the smallest seed. You know, there's this little orchid seed. That is right now the smallest seed if they don't, you know, genetically engineer something else. But that's the smallest seed. And, you know, whether the mustard seed, when it's full grown, can be categorized as a tree, well, it's really simply a bush. And I've seen a number of these mustard seeds and these mustard trees in Israel had a chance to go there. I mean, and they do get as tall as trees. And, of course, birds do nest in their branches. But the lesson in horticulture is not the aim of Jesus' teaching here. But the object of the parable is one of comparison. Par comparison between that which has a small beginning as compared to its huge disproportionate side, size when it becomes full grown. Something that starts out real tiny and when it's full grown, something that's huge, disproportionate. The kingdom of heaven in the heart starts out like the smallest of seeds. It's this little thing. It doesn't take much to get started. But as it grows, as it matures, it has the potential of becoming something greater than its initial size. It becomes the size of a tree having much more potential and impact than one would believe. Now, you see, I call these other things avocado seed events. When we talk about summer camp, when we talk about mission trips, when we talk about weeks of prayer, you know, all of those are the big seed events. And they have their place in the life and in the upbringing of our kids and, and, and drawing them closer to Christ. Those things, you know, are, are very important. We can't take anything from them. But I believe what Jesus is saying to us here in this text is, don't overlook the small things. Don't overlook or devalue the small efforts. Because it's those small things we do to get the kingdom into our kids that could result in great, great things. Because heaven is not dependent upon size or cost. And of course, there are many ways of planting seeds in the lives of children. And of course, some have been mentioned, one being church Sabbath school. Wasn't that a great Sabbath school program this morning? The home worship that I've mentioned, and other things that help, the small seed things that help. But the one area I'd like to focus on today is this right here. And this is real easy, but at the same time, it's difficult. If you're sleeping, wake up. Okay? Small things. Listen to this one. Simply hanging out and sharing life experiences with our kids. Did you hear that? I'm pretty sure some of you cringed at that. Like, whoa, I don't have time for that. But simply hanging out and spending time with our kids is an excellent way of planting the small seeds, the little small seeds. We call it doing home time. You know, instead of being out at the office or out in the streets running around playing basketball, whatever you do, it's called going home and spending time with the family. Hello. It's called taking the opportunity to do one-on-one -on -one with your children. Now, I'm not preaching at you. I'm preaching with you because I myself, am a, I am a parent too. 
And so what I'm saying to you, God has already beat me up about it. <laughs> you know, a number of years ago, uh, there were a number of commercials that aired that dealt with, you know, talking to kids about drugs. Yeah, there were a number of them, but my favorite one, I hope we can get it up on the screen here. Um, we're going to let it play if we can get it going, and it'll speak for itself. Need help? Get help. Visit our website at drugfree.org. Not talking about anything. Now just imagine with me what you could be talking to your kids about in a time or moment like that. Moments that I call insignificant moments. Nothing's really happening. Nothing's going on. But yet you're there together. And I'm not going to ask how many times we tend to sit in silence because maybe in our minds we're debriefing from the day or we're just worn out and we just want some peace and quiet. But how many times do we find ourselves in situations like that where it's just us, our kids, and nothing happening? You know, I call these seed moments. Or as the title of the sermon suggests, moments of insignificance. Because when we catch these insignificant moments and use them to plant seeds for the garden, for the kingdom of God, the results can be very powerful over time. Amen? And so here's what I like to do. I have found that the best seat moments for me is when I can share with my kids how I am personally growing or needing to grow in my walk with God. You know, I'm, I'm not there preaching to them, but I'm letting them know where I am in the Lord. And they see my struggles and, and they witness my struggles. But I like to call that, it's, I, I like to share that because it's called self disclosure. And I'm doing it to my kids about my personal character weaknesses. And I use that to teach them about the kingdom of heaven. So I have time just to share a few of these stories, you know, personal stories. You know, I don't want to see this on Facebook anywhere. But uh, here we go. We're going to jump into it. My first, my first weakness, and my kids know that I'm weak in this area. And so when I bring it up, they're going to say, yeah, uh-huh. You know, bad drivers, bad drivers bring out the critic in me. I, I see we have some people who identify with that. I mean, I can't hide it. When somebody is driving or they do something just crazy on the road, my mouth starts going off. And, and I have to go ahead and, and ask for forgiveness now because I know that I've spoken about some of you too. <laughs> As you are running and, and ripping to get your kids to, to John Coble or whatever, you come buzzing by me, I said, look at that nut. Why are they going through this road so fast? You know, my mouth is just going. My kids can attest to this. And I like to just say to you this morning, excuse me, I'm sorry. Yet I'm learning how to use this weakness for seed planting moments. Now, this is how this works. I mean, this is not something I, I sat down and I planned, but this is what happened. I'm riding on 53, minding my own business, got the car loaded with three of my kids who are riding. And, uh, you know, 53 is like five lanes, two going one direction, two going another, and then there's a middle lane there. I'm 
next to the middle lane going east. And out of my peripheral vision, I see this, this van just pull over. I mean, it, it comes towards me, and he, this, this van gets into the, the middle lane. And I'm just riding. I'm watching him. And instead of this guy slowing down and, and, and merging behind me, I, I guess he wanted to get in front of me because he matches my speed, and we're going down the road together. And so I'm looking at him. And uh, he's looking at me with his little partner sitting in the, in, the, in the passenger seat. And they both began to carry on. I mean, I guess they were cursing and swearing. They were, they were just making gestures. And, and you know, they, they were doing all these terrible things toward my car. <laughs> and uh, I, I just didn't understand. And, and so me being a, a good Christian... Not always on the road, but good Christian. I checked my right mirror. I let a car pass by, and I decide to move over. And uh, this van comes over into the lane that I once occupied. The light stops us. We're sitting there at the light. And they're still looking. They're looking at us, and they're still making these gestures. And I'm thinking to myself, honestly, church, I'm thinking to myself, as I look at them, I'm like, Stupid. <laughs> but there they are. But here's the thing. Here's the point where God kind of intervened. Because it's strange. I mean, it, this doesn't really happen all the time. But on this day, with my three kids in the car, it happened. God immediately touched my heart instead of my mouth. And right there on the spot, God Fill me with compassion towards my adversarial driver. Now, that has never happened before. <laughs> and one of the reasons why it may have happened is that I just happened to be sitting in the car with the windows up, with the air conditioning running and feeling real good, but my adversarial brother was sitting in a minivan with all the windows down, not wearing T-shirts, and I think that he was real hot. And I felt bad for him. <laughs> and so I decided that I was not going to retaliate. Because this guy was probably hot and irritated. Maybe he was trying to get to the bathroom or something. Maybe he was trying to get to Taco Bell or something. I don't know. But I just sat there in silence as he continued to yell and make these terrible gestures. And I mentioned to you that I had three passengers in the car. So I'm sitting there, and, and lo and behold, one of the passengers in my car, and I'm not going to tell you who they were, but they suggested that I pull up on the side of these people and that they would kindly take it upon themselves to express to this driver and his passenger the assumed collective sentiments of everyone in my car. <laughs> and they would do it all using sign language. <laughs> you know who you are. I won't tell if you don't tell. <laughs> but again, folk, God is good. Because he inspired this full-blown road warrior sinner like myself to let it go. And my kids can attest to this because at that moment I was inspired to share with my kids how the Lord is helping me to view people differently. Just right there on the spot. I, don't, I, I can't explain. It was God coming in, speaking, and me listening and doing what he's telling me to do. Helping me to see people differently even if they can't drive. I told them that people are facing many issues and don't really know how to deal with what they're dealing with. And so sometimes they just act it out in, 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 un, uh, in unfavorable ways. And I also shared how I'm learning to respect people even when people are not being respectful. And how I'm seeking to reframe from being judgmental on the road. Seriously. 
mean, it wasn't a lecture. It wasn't me setting myself up on a pedestal, pedestal because God knows my heart. But it was me allowing God to speak through the moment, through my personal weakness. And folk, my kids heard me. They heard me. And of course, yes, that one person was looking at me saying, you know, with, with this expression on their face as if saying, who are you? <laughs> I'm far from being perfect. And they are the first to point this out. But nevertheless, it was a mustard seed moment. And as a result, I want to believe that the seed of respect and compassion towards others will germinate and grow in their lives, giving them kingdom understanding. So that whenever they find themselves attempting to understand their friends or deal with difficult people, they in turn will possibly be respectful and show compassion towards them. Now, if this, now if, if this is not the present case with my kids, it's probably because the seed is still growing. That's how, you know, for you teachers that are dealing with my kids, okay? <laughs> but please understand this. It is taking advantage of those small, insignificant moments. Taking the time to plant a small seed. You're not doing sermons. You're just dropping little, small seeds. But those seeds have the potential to have a great impact upon the lives of our kids as those seeds germinate and grow. What do you say? Do I have time for a, another illustration? If everybody's, everybody's okay? It's kind of warmer here, isn't it? A lot of people in here, we generate body heat. We need this in the wintertime, not right now. Okay. All right. Now, this illustration came to my mind after a number of years ago, and it's a hard illustration for me because it brings back memories. But I'm going to share it with you anyway, okay? Because, I mean, whew. This illustrates that even when we're at our worst, seeds can be planted. A number of years ago, I had, uh, I had just went out and purchased a brand new car. I mean, it was one of few brand new cars, not a used, not a brand new used car, but a brand new car. Had been saving up for this thing for two years. Went and purchased it. It was, a, it was my dream car. Went and purchased it, and I just loved that car. Get out, wash it, wax it, get it serviced on time. You know, try not to fall, follow too close to trucks on the expressway, trying to keep it looking nice. Tried to park away from, you know, other cars in the parking lot so the doors wouldn't get dinged up. I mean, it's a nice car. And I would drive it to church, and I would park it out front church, you know, on the overflow parking lot, which was the front lawn. So I parked it out there. And one day, two teenagers decided to come to church for afternoon services, and they brought with them a slingshot. A slingshot. Who brings slingshots to church? These two knuckleheads. So they, there's a pole right there, you know, in the parking lot. They, they pick up a can and they place it on top of the pole and they decide that they're going to just take shots to try to knock this, this can off the pole. But only a couple of yards away from the pole is this big, black, shiny object that even a blind man could have seen. <laughs> and they're shooting. And, they, they, and, and I don't know what they were thinking, but, you know, the noise that it was making when it was hitting the car should have told them, oh, that's not special effects. We're hitting something. And so I walk out just to see that last rock fly, and pow! Eight, I mean, they weren't shooting pebbles, they were shooting rocks, okay? Eight 
large, huge dents up and down the side of my brand new car. Church, I was livid. I was doing everything I could, breathing hard, thinking happy thoughts. You know, I was trying my best to hold it together. But then one of those little smart mouth kids pushed the wrong button. How do they figure that thing out? You know, what the, what, what the, what the final button is. I mean, he, he knew it and he pushed it. He said, how, he, he said, he's telling me this, you shouldn't have parked it there. <laughs> and I'm like, dude, you shouldn't have brought a slingshot to church. You shouldn't have parked it there. I mean, oh, man, oh, something went all over me. I, all I could do was think about giving these kids a dry baptism right there in the parking lot. In the name of Jesus, whoom! <laughs> I was so angry. These little, these little demons bringing a <laughs> slingshot to church and shooting up my car. You know, and not only that, what made it even worse because I was showing out. What made it even worse is one of these little demons had the audacity to say, you're supposed to be a pastor. <laughs> you, 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 you aren't supposed to get upset. I'm like, boy, give me that slingshot. Where's your mama's car at? I'll show you who's upset. I tell you, on that day, not one mustard seed fell. In fact, I was walking around pulling up mustard seeds that I had planted early that day, teaching Sabbath school lesson. Oh, I was upset. I was mad. You know, but we all fell. Hello. None of us are perfect. Sometimes we even destroy faith moments even pulling up the seeds that we've worked so hard to plant. Parents are not perfect. Teachers are not perfect. My haircut might not be all that perfect. But the problem is many times we're the last to realize it and to acknowledge that we're not perfect. And our kids know it. They know it. And there is no greater opportunity to plant kingdom seeds than when we are dealing with issues of personal weakness. And when we are willing to admit that we're wrong, and when we are willing to invite God into our lives to bring about kingdom growth inside of us, to grow our character, to make us better people. You know... On the following Friday night of that slingshot incident, I, garret, I, I, I gathered up those, those two teenagers. And I had a heart-to-heart -heart discussion with them. I let them know that I failed, that I messed up big time. I had allowed an object to come between my love and my service to God and my love and service to people people of the church. And then I asked those youth to not only forgive me of my big mess up, but I asked them to pray for me. I said, your pastor needs prayer. I need you to pray for me. And there was silence in heaven for a span of one half hour. But then one of them, the cheeky one, broke silence and said, and this is true, he said, that's the way a pastor is supposed to act. That's the way a pastor is supposed to act. You are my pastor. Folk, that is the way 
a teacher is supposed to act. Being willing to admit the shortcomings and soliciting forgiveness and asking for prayer. That is the way a parent is supposed to act. That is the way we adults are supposed to act when dealing with our weaknesses. Because in so doing, our kids begin to understand what it means to forgive and to be forgiven. You know, for those kids, God, I mean, for, for all of our kids, we were able to do that. God would no longer appear to them as a being whose sole purpose is to keep tally of who's getting it right and who's getting it wrong. But he will become known as a compassionate God, one who is loving, one who is forgiving, one who is kind. A God who desires to come alongside of us, walk alongside of us, and do life together with us. Nurturing kingdom growth within their hearts, from within and all around. That's the kind of God that they begin to see when we do what pastors, parents, and teachers are supposed to do. Because I believe that the most successful seed planting occurs when we plant seeds from within our weakness, where we're struggling with life, where we're having difficulties, letting them know that, hey, you know what? Mom is not perfect. I'm not perfect, but God is perfect, and he's willing to help us. Amen? We call them insignificant moments, which lead to significant growth. Now, I'm moving right along here. My wife and I, we are real people. Even though we have a pastor's home, we're real and we're struggling with some of the same problems that you're struggling with when it comes down to raising your kids. It's challenging. And few people are coming up to us as parents, as teachers, as pastors, saying to us, good job. Good job. That doesn't happen all that often. Therefore, I believe that we who are in this battle together on the same battlefield fighting for the same thing, somehow or another we need to find a way to affirm one another, to stop pointing fingers and saying, well, if you were giving it to them at home, they would get it when they would have it when they come to school. Or if you were teaching it at school, then they will bring it home with a no. Somehow, we need to affirm and pray for what teachers are doing in the classrooms. And at the same time, affirm and pray for what parents are doing at home. Affirming and praying for everyone who has influence upon the lives of our children. Many times, Pauline will handle a situation with one of the kids in an amazing way. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just there listening, and I, I see how she is, she is, you know, navigating the waters and kind of laying it out, and, 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 and she's not losing her cool. Okay, sometimes she loses her cool. But she's not allowing the, she's not allowing the sister to come out. If you don't know what the sister, if you don't know who the sister is, talk to the sister and they'll tell you about the sister. You don't want the sister to come out. But when she is getting it right, you know, I have a, I have a way of affirming her. You know, I walk up to her and I point at her and I say, you on your way to the, uh, to the kingdom, girl. I say, you on your way to heaven. You handle that very well. God is smiling on you because you didn't get upset, but you dealt with the issues in the most Christian-like manner. And we just laugh about it. It's all fun. But I think that we are all due some affirmation today. Amen? 
I'm going to ask you to do something just to help you to wake up a little bit. I'm almost finished here. But why don't you just turn to your neighbor, whether teacher, parent, or whatever, just look at one another, give that thumbs up, and say, good job. Good job on your parenting. Good job on your teaching. Good job for whatever it is you do. Didn't that feel great? Good job. Hey, you, you do the same thing, kids. You know, good job, Mom and Dad. You have all day and all weekend and all next week to do it. I'll be looking for it. My last illustration here. You know, we, we're, the whole challenge here is to look for those moments of insignificance, those times when nothing is going on, and just asking God to, you know, show you where can I plant a small seed for the kingdom of God? Where can I, where can I insert something, you know, that's meaningful to me, something about my life that they, they can probably identify with and, and you can testify about it? You know, something that will, will be there. I mean, it will be undetectable, but as life goes on, you, you, you know by faith that it's going to grow, that it's going to mean something to them. You know, sometimes it's hard to find those moments, and so you have to sometimes create them yourselves, look them up, you know, set these things up. Um, I decided to, to take my youngest child, Ethan, with me on one of the many camp meetings that Georgia Cumberland Conference has, and we would be on the road for a couple of hours. And so I'm thinking, you know, let's create some moments. I want to just drop a few seeds in his little mind here. And so I, I turned to Ethan and I said, let's talk about anything you want to talk about. You know, you have my full attention for one solid hour. Let's go. Not one word. And I, anybody who knows Ethan knows that he likes to, he likes to talk. He enjoys conversation, but not one word. And I was pulling tooth and nail to try to get him to talk about something, but nothing. Pauline, that's the secret weapon. If you ever need him to be quiet, just ask him, let's talk about anything you want to talk about. But... Whenever I'm in the middle of doing stuff, whenever I'm doing things that are important, I mean kingdom stuff, church stuff, when I need to be alone and, and, and have my mind focused upon something, then that's when Ethan and the girls are ready to talk. Come on, give me a break. That's when they're ready to talk. But that's when I need to realize that it's planting season. That it's time for me to push aside those other things. Though they are very important, they have deadlines on it, I might not get this opportunity again for a while. And so it's planting season, and it's time for me to listen, engage in conversation with the hopes and thoughts of planting Seeds. Because mustard seeds start with the small things. They start with insignificant moments. And when they are planted, they have the potential of incredible kingdom growth in the lives of our children. The challenging thing about being able to recognize and capture those moments of insignificance, those mustard seed moments. The thing that makes it so hard is that we parents, we teachers, we adults must live lives that are connected with God. Personally relating to God, we personally relating to God, not on a mustard seed level, but we personally relating to him on a mustard tree level or mustard bush level 
Because only mustard seeds can, mustard trees can produce mustard seeds. And if the kingdom of heaven is not actively growing in your life, if you're not fertilizing it through prayer and allowing it to be pruned by the word of God, you will find your seed producing moments very rare. I'm going to say the same thing in a different manner. If we ourselves are not growing in our understanding of the grace of God and how it impacts our life, if we're not maintaining spiritual health but are ailing, rotting from a history of bad soil and lack of fertilizer, and have yet to invite the master gardener into our lives to rebalance the soil, to fertilize it, the roots, and prune the branches of questionable habits, then there won't be many seeds produced. Because sick mustard trees produce little or no seeds. Because we can only give what we have to give. So, I know I've been speaking as a fellow parent to parents and to educators and administrators and pastors and medical providers and cafeteria staff, whoever, and in whatever manner you intersect the lives of our kids, our children, our young people. But my plea to all of us is to first of all, be intentional about nurturing and growing the kingdom of heaven in your own personal lives. You can't let that go. We all must be personally connected to the life giver. We must know God, know his will, and be willing to live according to his will. How many of you can sincerely say that you will make this a subject of prayer, that you will be intentional in your desire to become mature mustard seeds by personally knowing God, his will, and living according to it? Raise your hand. Amen. The second thing, which is just as important, and the last thing, be intentional in looking for those opportunities to plant seed for the kingdom of heaven in the lives of our young people. Seek to do it during those moments of insignificance when you're just hanging out with your kids, doing life together with them, whatever that might look like in your context. If that is your desire, if that is your endeavor, let me hear you say amen. I just want to thank you for allowing the Spirit of God to speak into your heart and mind this afternoon. In Jesus' name, amen. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, just thank you so much for this day and thank you that it's your Sabbath, God, and that we just get to take a break and breathe. Lord, please be with each and every one of us as we're here, God. Thank you for all the parents that were able to be here, Lord. And Lord, just help us to be able to grow in you and become more like you each and every day, God. Help us to grow our, in our relationships with you and with other people and help it to be strengthened, God. I love you and thank you, and please be with us as we start departing our ways, God, and just thank you for the school, and thank you for all these people who make this school possible, and thank you for such a blessing that the school has been to me and so many other people, God. Just help us to have a wonderful Sabbath and find our rest in you today, and we love you and we thank you for blessing us abundantly. In your precious and holy name I pray, amen.